Next, I'm just going to ask the, the panel whether there's anything there, any of them, is burning to say in response to the others before I throw it open to the audience. Anything you... Yes. Um, I'd just like to say, say two things. Um, uh, Dickens is undoubted in response, I think, to what I'm assuming, so Dickens is undoubted as sympathy for um, the child worker, the young, the young person condemned to work in some, um, some ghastly ghastly factory or mode of living. But the great thing about David Copperfield, um, you know, the terrible instance of the, of the blacking factory where the young David sits there working with Mealy Potatoes and Mick Walker and the other ones, is that however much the sympathy that you, you can know, you can infer from that, shining through that book, is that the person that Dickens really sympathised with was himself. His younger self. And in fact, the whole problem of what and, and so David David is, is removed from the from the blacking uh, from the, uh, the blacking factory, but the other boys stay there. And you get the impression that um, although Dickens had this marvelous, large, generous sympathy um, towards all kinds of what a, a great you know, this is not a complaint about Dickens because Orwell did it himself in his own novels. Uh, what the writer is really complaining about is some of the circumstances visited on the writer himself at an early age. The other point, general point I would make about is that um, in response to what Mr. Michael said is that throughout these books, and all these novels, you can see Dickens diagnosing with tremendous swear and pertinacity huge flaws which are driven through virtually all our national institutions such as the civil service, the educational system, uh, industrial labour, all this kind of thing. And yet, what does Dickens want in the end? When you get down to it, when you get down to the bottom of any kind of vestige of political program he has, what he wants is things to be slightly changed, but not very much. Uh, and so, for example, a novel like Hard Times, there is there are huge, there's large amounts of satire lavished on Mr. Grand Bryan and his academy, um, and Dickens, of course, um, and there again, Dickens, of course, sent his own children to Eton, and um, one, yes, of one of his children. No, my actual word, Dickens, called Dickens. <laughs> and um, sent one of his children to Eton, and yet you get the impression at the end of hard times that what Dickens actually wants in education is something that isn't too far removed from Mr. Grand Bryan's academy, with just a little less fact, a little fewer facts, and a little less browbeating for the children. And it's the same, he sees, you know, he sees the flaw, he sees that the civil service and the industrial system are completely flawed and run by the wrong kind of people in the wrong kind of way, but an actual root and branch reform of things is too much for him. And so we are left with just this great injunction that we should behave better uh, without an accompanying, uh, accompanying realisation that people will only behave better and, and if the system is redeveloped in a way that encourages that behaviour. Right, good. Now, thank you very much. Yes. Add a few footnotes to so, so, so many wrong things have been said <laughs> uh, about Dickens. I mean, for example, that he never described the railway journey and so on. His wonderful journalism is full of this, but in the novels there's a superb description when Mr. Dobby goes to Leavington uh, of, of uh, a very memorable description uh, of a railway. Dickens was always writing about railways and spent half his life travelling on them, of course. When was this oh, goes. Oh, oh, indeed, yes. I mean, the first uh, character in fiction to be killed by railway was Dickens. <laughs> Think about the old radiant idleness and so on at the end of every novel that, that uh, uh, Orwell uh, talks about. That was true, perhaps, of the, of the early Dickens, but certainly not at the end. I mean, when Dickens is great masterpiece, Little Dorrit, at the end of Little Dorrit, Little Dorrit and Arthur Clennam, Dickens deliberately says they, they, after they're married, they descend into the street, into this busy street where the, the, the froward and the vain and so on, and they, they're fretting and making their usual uproar, and they've got all these various tasks to do, to become <coughs> fannies, neglected children, to do this, to do that and the other. Uh, it's certainly not radiant idleness uh, any more than it is for Sissy Duke, uh, not Sissy Duke, um, for, for um, the heroine uh, of the, uh, whose name is against me for the moment, uh, of <laughs> times, um, Louisa. Uh, yes, um, and uh, there was oh well, there were so many things um, that uh, I, I should have made notes really. But, but I, I think the big thing that really emerges is that, that obviously the, both, both David's have uh, concentrated, I suppose, fair enough, on 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 Dickens's fiction. Um, but as I have tried to show in the recent biography that I wrote, I mean. Uh, half of Dickens' output was this fantastic, topical, up-to-the-minute journalism 
yeah. and um, in, in which he was campaigning for this and that, and was very much uh, engaged in things. And as to him just sort of being in a nice comfort zone and saying, well, you know, it'd be nice if something would be done and so on. Think of what he did, uh, for example, in running a home for homeless women. It's always called a home for fallen women because it sounds more exciting. <laughs> it was actually called a home for homeless women. Uh, women coming out of prisons and so forth. Um, for 10 years, it was financed by Angela Dickens, <coughs> but Dickens actually ran it. He attended meetings, uh, committee meetings every week. Um, as uh, uh, that great um, Dickens critic, Country House, said, I mean, the sheer charitable grind of Dickens's work, that was only the most spectacular thing uh, of what he did. Uh, and when you think that this was the major novelist of the decade as well, uh, my God, he was involved in his society, and through his journalism, he wrote and campaigned about it. So I think you've been you've been given a slightly by this, this focusing on the novels and, and really on the early novels up to David Copperfield by and large, uh, except for the special case of Hard Times. Um, I, I think you know, it would be very interesting to make uh, a comparison of 1984 and Tale of Two Cities. Uh, about the, the, these two great writers' treatment of, of revolution and so on, and that might be more profitable uh, than some of the, uh, the rather uh, misleading, I, I say, um, columns uh, that would be made about Dickens on this platform. <laughs> now, uh, over to you. Uh, we have roving mics, as usual. There's somebody here to begin with. Yes, and if you want to, just wait for the mic. Yes, um, if you want to address your question or your comment to a particular member of the panel, can you say so? Yes, thank you. Um, didn't uh, Orwell create his own grand grind, the clergyman's daughter, when he would do the tutorials in the school, <clears throat> and the only thing that she wanted was copper plate handwriting? Etc. Etc. That was it. That's right. And the, uh, the first, the first sentence in the French uh, textbook, uh, which was called "All You Will Need for Your Parisian Trip," uh, the first phrase you had to translate was "Lace my stays, but not too tightly." <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite right. And that was based. Yes. That's certainly based. That was on. Was it was in a way. It was. Uh, I think. No, it, it's not so much that. But I, I think there is a comparison. There is a distinction to be drawn. You know, I, I, I quite take your point about negligible sort of forms of education, but. The, uh, essentially, um, the school that Dorothy teaches at the clergyman's daughter is just a sham, where nothing is taught, and the drunken chemistry <coughs> master simply stands there and says, there are 93 elements, girls, 93, and next week we're going to have a very interesting experiment that nothing ever happens. Whereas uh, Dickens, in, in Hard Times, is specifically attacking the utilitarian idea of education, that a fact is only useful <laughs> if it actually tells you something and is material to your... So a horse is a grand liver of well, a she does, yes. She gets the wide world. I agree. And for, for those of you not familiar with the Clergyman's Daughter, which is rather a minor, or well, not, and it does end with, with, with Dorothy, um, its heroine, in this terrible, sort of cheap, awful school in West London. And it is a really, it is pathetic in the, in the, the proper sense of the word, how she sort of spends her own wages trying to sort of improve the girls' lot and teach them properly, and then it's just sort of thrown out on the wind by the. It's a very, it's a very Dickensian. A very Dickensian chapter, wouldn't you say that, and showing, showing again the influence of the master. So, so certainly, yes, I would, I would accept that comparison.